Hello, it's nice to have you with us today. Today is Communion Sunday, so if you'd like to get some juice and some crackers ready, um, after the re Bible reading, we'll be having Communion. Today's Bible reading is 1 Chronicles 29, 11 to 16. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power and the glory, the victory and the majesty, for all that is in heaven and in earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head over all. Both riches and honor come from you, and you reign over all. In your hand is power and might. In your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. Now, therefore, our God, we thank you and praise your glorious name. But who am I and who are the people that we should be able to offer so willingly as this? For all things come from you, and of your own we have given you. For we are aliens and pilgrims before you, as were all our fathers. Our days on earth are as shadow and without hope. O Lord our God, all this abundance that we have prepared to build you a house for your holy name is from your hand and is all your own. Good morning. How are you today? Hope everything is well. We are going to celebrate communion shortly. And then after that, we'll be moving right into the morning message. So let's just open with a word of prayer, and then I'll be looking at Luke 22, and we'll be following communion from there. And when the hour, sorry, we'll pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity that we have to be before you. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness and mercy to us. We thank you for your wonderful hands in our life. We thank you for the guidance. We thank you for the provision of the Holy Spirit. We thank you for your local church. And we thank you for the gospel that is so wonderfully used around this world. We ask, Lord, that you would receive all the glory and praise and honor today from our hearts full of praise and worship to you. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. In Luke 22, verses 14 to verse 20, it says this. And when the hour had come, he sat down and the twelve apostles with him. And then he said to them with fervent desire, I have desire to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Yes, on the night that Jesus was betrayed, by the hand of his betrayer, he was still giving praise to God. And in this moment, of all moments, on the, on the Passover evening, he took the bread. See, Jesus is the bread of life, and his body would be broken for us. Take and eat. Father, we pause for a minute in your presence today. And we thank you for the goodness and the mercy lavished upon us when we don't deserve it. Thank you, Lord, for your beloved Son, the one who is the only begotten, the firstborn amongst all the brethren, who gave his life as a ransom for us, who is the suffering servant of Isaiah, and who is the bread of life. We give you praise and thanks now in Jesus' name. Amen. Likewise, on the same evening, on the Passover evening, he took the cup, which was the cup that he would say, this cup is basically representing my blood, which is shed for you. 
the blood of Christ being shed for us. He took our place on a cross, was nailed, beaten and tortured, and put on a place on a cross between criminals, yet he had done no wrong. His blood was shed for us, the only blood that could cleanse us from all sin. Take and drink. Again, Lord, we pause in your presence, marveling at the grace of Christ. And we use that wonderful word grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. Yes, Lord, the blood of Christ shed for us to cleanse us, to renew us, and to bring us in favor with you, to bring us in harmony with you. All done that you would be glorified and honored. And we give you the glory and we give you the praise now. In Jesus' name, amen. The chorus in the chaos. In 2 Chronicles 7, 3, it says this, When all the children of Israel saw how the fire came down and the glory of the Lord on the temple, they bowed their faces to the ground on the pavement and worshipped and praised the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his mercy endures forever. In Psalm 95, verse 6, it says, O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. And in Revelation 15, 4, it says, Who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy, for all nations shall come and worship before you, for your judgments have been manifested. We come in a very sacred place this morning, as I'm going to now read Revelation 4, verses 4 to 11, a mighty chapter in the book of Revelation, describing the throne scene of heaven. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power. Oh, wrong text. Around the throne were 24 elder thrones, and on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. And from the throne proceeded lightnings, thunderings, and voices, the seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Before the throne, there was a sea of glass, like crystal. And in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and back. The first living creature was like a lion. The second living creature like a calf or an ox. And the third living creature had a face like a man. And the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. The four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within, and they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever. The 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they exist and were created. I recently read about Sir Isaac Newton, the great physicist, and mathematician. One day as Newton was in his room at Trinity College in Cambridge, through a narrow slit in the shutters, white sunlight struck the glass prism on his desk. He noticed that the white light split the colors of the rainbow. And then there it dawned on him that light was a complex unity of different colors. Here in the prism of revelation, God is light in the sense that he is holy and sovereign merciful and totally just. Do you see the colors? That is what we ought to see here. We are to envision John's great vision of a great and victorious God who is unparalleled in every way. He is three times holy, the holy, sovereign, merciful, and just God who is on the eternal throne. Yes, that is the holy, biblical, forever faithful truth, which is, the eternal God is on the throne, and there is a heavenly chorus being sung amongst all the chaos. Hallelujah. 
We are given a treasury of insights throughout the book of Revelation. And Jesus is presented as the lamb who is seated on the throne and being worshipped. You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power is sung throughout Revelation. You have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. We need to receive a fresh revelation of Jesus Christ every day so that we do not fall asleep at our assigned mission. We need to know he is coming back soon. Having a vision of Jesus will also give us the inner strength to stand for the glorious gospel in this hostile world. But we also need to see God's throne in heaven and see his majesty and glory and power. He holds the throne in absolute power over this world. No demon, no ruler, no Caesar, no dictator, no person, no angel. He is the Holy One with authority to determine the future. Let's look at the wonderful participants in this vivid scene before us. One was sitting on the throne, it says in verse 3. He was sitting and was like a jasper stone and a sardis in appearance. That is, he was diamond on the one hand and ruby on the other. There was that shining, dazzling brilliance of a diamond and the deep blood red shine of a sardis, which would be like a ruby. And so the Apostle John sees the living God depicted in appearance as a jasper, as a diamond, and as a sardis, which is red like ruby. And certainly we see his shining brilliant, his pure glory, and also the essence of his sacrificial act on the behalf of mankind represented in the red color that he sees. And he who sat there was like a jasper and a sardis stone in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like a beautiful emerald. You see, around the throne, there was a rainbow, which was like an emerald in appearance. A very unique rainbow, not multicolored, but the color of an emerald, which probably would be the symbol of God's grace and God's mercy as a rainbow symbolized in the day of Noah. The 24 elders are next. They are worshipers of the living God. They are continually beholding the intense beauty of God Almighty. The 24 elders are clothed in white garments. For in the book of Revelation, it is the garments of the saints, which is the robes of righteousness. The 24 elders always join in on the praise of God. And if the living ones never rest, the elders don't either. They are constantly worshiping the one sitting on the throne. This is the reason for their existence. The throne of God. From the throne proceed flashes of lightning, voices, and peals of thunder. And we will see something much like that in Mount Sinai in the Old Testament. And the Holy One, the Almighty, is on this throne, the most holiest place in all of the universe. The seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. The sevenfold spirit of God. The Holy Spirit, in other words, in a sevenfold aspect of glory. This is not referring to seven Holy Spirits, but seven aspects of the Holy Spirit. And seven is the number of his perfection. The Spirit of the Lord, which is the eternal life-giving Spirit, Hebrews 9, 14. The Spirit of wisdom, as it will be mentioned in Isaiah 11, 2. The Spirit of understanding, the Spirit of counsel, who gives direction, the Spirit of strength or might the spirit of knowledge, and the spirit of the Lord, or the fear of the Lord, who gives reverent terror and unrestrained worship, also found in Isaiah 11.2. The four living creatures that were the closest to God were those who were continually gazing upon God. These are called seraphim. Seraphim literally means the burning ones. They are set ablaze by gazing upon the consuming fire of God, and they are doing what they were created to do. They are worshiping the living God. The living ones never rest. They constantly proclaim the holiness of God. They are praising Almighty God for His holiness by saying this refrain over and over, holy, 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 because He is. Then they say He is sovereign by using the word Lord because He is. Then they will refer to his omnipotence, saying God Almighty, because he is. And then they will refer to his eternality, which was and is and is to come, 
for he is always eternal. Those four living creatures are full of eyes, eyes everywhere, and they have one responsibility, which is to gaze upon God. This is the only thing that they have done for all of eternity and will continue to do throughout all eternity. This is the eternal perspective, friends, gazing upon the Lord Almighty. These living ones' eyes are full of eyes, the eyes which move within every portion of the being, indicating the incomprehensible, amazing ability to see and watch. They are all seeing, taking in God and everything else. The four living beings are also also lead the redeemed in the worship of God Almighty. In verse 9, which says, The living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, to him who lives forever and ever. This is their eternal occupation, their eternal joy, and their eternal privilege. Many interpretations have been given of these four beings, but this one is as sound as any. They are like the lion, the mightiest of beasts, the king of the jungle indicates majesty and power. And next, we'll see the ox, the strongest domesticated animal, typical of faithful labor and patience. Next, the greatest bird, the eagle, represents supreme sovereignty and supremacy. And one was like a man, indicating intelligence and the fact that man was to have dominion over all the earth. Yes, the four beings suggest whatever is noblest, strongest, wisest, and swiftest in all of nature or the created order. And they are singing, holy, holy, holy. It is the only attribute of God repeated three times. The Bible never says God is mercy, 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 or grace, grace, grace. But it does declare without reservation, he is holy, holy, holy. It is repeated three times because it is the summation of all that God is. It is his most amazing attribute. God's holiness is his utter and complete separation from evil in every way and in every form. And that makes him different than his entire creation. Worship, did you know, is not a a human invention. Brethren, it is a divine offering. Worth plus ship equals he is worthy of reverence and honor. When we worship, we are declaring God's holy worth. Worship is an act of honoring God because of his great worthiness to be honored. Worship brings us into his presence as well. The psalmist says, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his holy name in Psalm 100 verse 4. When we are in in his presence, we understand his power and ability. Through worship, the Holy Spirit redirects our focus onto God and away from ourselves. An authentic worship of God can only be found in a relationship with Jesus Christ. Salvation is the first step in developing a worshipful heart. And the only access to the Father is through his Son, Jesus Christ. C.S. Lewis, in a few of his most famous books, especially The the Last Battle, which is the seventh in the Narnia series, says that he portrays heaven as a kind of adventure, as we are called by God to move, running much faster than we possibly could on earth. Further up and further in, heaven in his stories is like an ongoing, eternal adventure of discovery, as we learn more of our Lord moment by eternal moment. If we are uncomfortable on earth here, singing praises to God, brethren, we must get over it, because it is something we will be doing throughout all of eternity. And we should be glad to be on the Lord's side. Isn't the victory of Jesus over sin and death worth celebrating with joy and praise? Is not his glorious redemption of your soul worthy of glorious exaltation and shouts of hallelujahs? Singing is a wonderful way of worshiping God. Did you know that the first time the word sing occurs in the Bible, it is a victory song? God had just rescued Israel from the Egyptians by parting the waters of the Red Sea. And then when Israel had passed through and were safe on the other side, God caused the waters to come together again and defeat the enemy. Also, we see in 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10, it says, But you are a chosen people, a a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. 
Yes, worthy are you, O Lord, God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. The attributes of God's holiness and eternality, using the superlative holy, holy, holy. God is holy, eternal, all the time. I have three points this morning, and here they are. The holy activity, that's the first. The second, the hallowed adoration. And the third, the humble admiration. First, the holy activity. Heaven's ensemble is seen right at the beginning of this mighty text. Heaven's chorus is full of praise and holy delight. The vision is, is intended to unveil reality to us. As N.T. Wright puts it, behind the complex and messy confusions of church life in ancient Turkey, behind the challenges of the fake synagogues and the threatening rulers, behind the ambiguous struggles and difficulties of ordinary Christians, there stands a heavenly throne room in which the world's creator and Lord remains totally sovereign. Only by stopping in our tracks and contemplating this vision can we begin to glimpse the reality which not only makes sense of our own realities, but enables us to win the victory. Listen to the ceaseless song of adoration. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, which who was and is and is to come. The powerful repetition, repetition of holiness is impressive and should be impacting. Holiness is of first importance with God and in the worship of God. In a world where evil is rampant and goodness is mocked and sweared at, there is one who will not give in to sin or allow his integrity to slip or degenerate. God is always and will be the thrice holy God. Our God is good. And he is separate from any form of evil. He is absolute pure, totally and completely undefiled, never with sin. He is the Lord Almighty. And we learn that real power resides not with evil and deception, but only with the Lord God Almighty in Revelation 4.8. God's holiness and power existed before the beginning of creation. And God's holy character has not faded or diminished with him, with time either. He who was and is is the one who is to come. God's power and eternal being guarantees his holiness will triumph over all evil. The first words John hears spoken in heaven are praise. How important is worship in heaven? How important is the praise of almighty God in your life? One of the first targets we must aim for in our worship is to be in the spirit. Notice verse 2 of Revelation 4. John was not taken to see the throne room of heaven until he was in the spirit. True worship, you know, is a very spiritual thing. I think of John 4, verse 21 to 26, when Jesus tells the Samaritan woman that true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. Commit yourself to worship with God. We need to realize that we will not be able to worship until we surrender to to him, everything of our heart. Let's notice the length and posture of worship. The four living creatures never give rest. Day and night, they never cease. To praise God, from whom all blessings flow. Whether they literally worship around the clock and engage in the sole occupation of adoration and praising the Lord, only time will tell when we see it for ourselves. Adoration is their constant attitude. And what we do know is that they embody the central theme of John's prophecy, the worship of God Almighty. And now they cast their, throne, their, their crowns before his feet. What does this mean? They have no preoccupation with their own excellence. They have no concern about their own beauty, their own holiness, their own honor, or their own reward. That means nothing to them. They are so lost in adoration. Like the four creatures, we are here to worship God, always. And the more we focus on the Lord, the closer we will be drawn to him. Secondly, the hallowed adoration. What is the posture of worship here? Did you see it, friend? In the text, it is on the floor, face down, casting crowns before God. In antiquity, if one king was conquered by another, the conquered king would take off his crown and place it at the feet of the conqueror. <laughs> This was a sign of heartfelt submission. Did you know Christians aren't conquered by God? 
But we do, however, can show our submission as well as our humility, thankfulness, and gratitude by giving back to God what he has given to us. With the posture of worship presented here, the bowing before, the casting crowns, the high praise, here is something to think about. Our secular culture celebrates Earth Day one day a year. But who? Who celebrates Creator Day 52 Sundays a year? We should aim to come to the throne of God in holiness. Those 24 elders were surrounding the throne of God are not described as being clothed in, in white for no reason. It is mentioned because we must understand the fact that to be in God's presence, we must be holy. So commit yourself to living a holy life. Make the Lord's Day a priority each Sunday, a time when you renew yourself with God and clear away all the stains. Wayne Grudem writes, even though there will be degrees of reward in heaven, the joy of each person will be full and complete for eternity. If we ask how this can be when there are different degrees of reward, it simply shows that our perception of happiness is based on an assumption that happiness depends on what we possess. Our true happiness, he says, consists in delighting in God, embracing God in all his glory. And when you do, his radiance will illuminate the dark places of your soul, warm the cold places of your heart, and shine a light on your path. Entering into God's presence, expecting his love, peace, and joy to overtake you, no matter how you feel at the moment. Oh, friends, it's proclaiming that he is bigger than anything that you can face in this life. Did you know that John Bunyan in the 1600s wrote, He who is most in the bosom of God, and who so acts for him there, he is the man who is best able to most enjoy God in the kingdom of heaven. Thirdly, the humble admiration, the applause, the alluring wonder. Our goal, brethren, as a church, is to see something of God's infinite greatness, because as Augustine famously put it, the thought of God should stir us so deeply that we cannot be content unless we praise him, for he made us for himself, and our hearts are restless and find no peace till they find their rest in him. The anthem of all who are in heaven is repeated for the listening heart in verse 11. Worthy are you, O Lord, God, and, and, and to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and because of your will, they exist and were created. The point of chapter 4 is summed up in this verse. All creatures in heaven give glory and honor and praise to God because he is the creator and sustainer of absolutely everything. Yes, he is worthy, friends, and it should be our greatest pleasure to worship him. Worship is a quickening of the conscience by the holiness of God, a feeding of the mind with the truth of God, an opening of the heart to the love of God, and a devoting of the will to the purpose of God, author unknown. It is indeed the chief end of our existence to glorify God by enjoying him forever, says the Westminster Shorter Catechism. So today, as always, amid the uncertainty, worship God. In his book called The Final Quest, Rick Joyner describes a scene. At a reception honoring musician Sir Robert Mayer on his 100th birthday, elderly British socialite Lady Diana Cooper fell into a conversation with a friendly woman who seemed to know her very well. Lady Diana Cooper's failing eyesight prevented her from recognizing her fellow guest until she peered more closely and realized she was talking to Queen Elizabeth. Overcome with total embarrassment, Lady Diana Cooper stuttered and stammered, Ma'am, uh, ma'am, uh, ma I'm, I'm so sorry. I didn't recognize you without your crown. It was so much Sir Robert even evening, the Queen replied, that I decided to leave it behind. When we come to worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we need to humble ourselves before the Lord. But for so many people, pride gets in the way and they refuse to bow before the Lord Almighty. Let your worship be in spirit and truth and humble yourselves and sing to the Lord to show yourself as one who is thankful for what all he has done for you. Our thoughts must be centered on God. Worship is the natural outflow of a mind filled with God's truth and wonder. In his book, The Supremacy of God in Preaching, John Piper writes, People are starving for the greatness of God, but most of them would not give this diagnosis to their troubled lives. The majesty of God is an unknown cure. 
there are far more popular prescriptions on the market. But the benefit of any other remedy is very brief and very shallow. Preaching that does not have the aroma of God's greatness may entertain for a season, but it will not touch the hidden cry of the soul, which is, show me your glory. Worship is not just a song. It's a way of life. It's not just for musicians and good singers. It's for every child of God. It's not just for 20 minutes a week either, friend. It's an ongoing daily attitude that reminds us of his greatness and our dependency upon him. Coming in contact with the holiness of God by the power of the Holy Spirit and letting his beauty touch you and rub off on you and make you beautifully holy and wonderfully whole is a beautiful thing. I believe this is our greatest achievement in life, which is to honor God. To honor God. Any glory or honor or recognition given to us belongs to him. From him and to him and for him are all good things, Romans 11 says. Every good gift and perfect gift comes from him, James 1 says. Any ability or talent, appearance or power or fame we receive is entirely an expression of the great goodness imputed to us for a short time on this earth. Satan wanted worship for himself. Saints and brethren should seek to bring worship to their God. No matter how godless the world may seem, God has a plan and he is working his mighty plan out for his great and grand purpose. He made things and he made us for his purpose, for his own good pleasure. Evil is real and deceptively powerful, but his divine purpose stands for all eternity. In conclusion, I would like to remind us of this today, despite everything that's going on. God is on the throne right now. In this very second of time, brethren, a Christ-centered local body or church is a delightful foretaste of heaven, a grand opportunity to set self aside and worship the King of Kings with other Christians in jubilant glee. All the splendor and glory of heaven to which we have been invited. Do you know we have been invited to this? God de desires us to participate and partake of his living presence like a well of living water to our thirst, like light and clarity to our confusion. He is the eternal one of all glory on his universal total throne of all power and authority for all eternity. So captured, has it captured your attention and devotion like those around the throne? When you are given a new bodily existence in heaven, you will be changed. I will be changed. And worship will be as thrilling and exciting as it is to the four living beings and those who cast their crowns. Make it a regular habit during the next few weeks to offer the Lord a sacrifice of praise. As you read, as you pray, as you do the dishes, take a coffee break or go for a walk. Let your heart flow out to God in a wonderful torrent of praise. You can use the Psalms as a starting point or even use bits of revelation and to enter into his gates with thanksgiving. Take some time during this week to revere God's name and think more about him. Praise God for all that he is. Let your heart flow to God in surrender and thanksgiving. Focus on God's holiness and tell him that he is worthy of your praise. Take your pride, your accomplishments, and whatever concerns you and, and lay them at the, his feet in total surrender to him. And, and as you attend corporate worship, in the next few weeks, practice the presence of God on the way to the church as a means of preparing your heart for wonderful worship. Why do you come to church on Sunday? Some people go to be entertained. Some people go because somebody made them go. Do you know what our number one reason should be? The number one reason that we should go to church is to worship God. Only as we worship him in humble submission can we see more fully the glories of God. The right response of any vision of God Almighty is to fall before him, broken, contrite, sensing our sin and our unworthiness, overwhelmed with a holy fear and a holy awe that translates into obedient worship obedient duty, and a heart of heartfelt gratitude for his wonderful, awesome, incredible mercy to us as sinners. Our enterprise, our occupation, our activity, our noble business is to praise him, 
T.S. Eliot once wrote that hollow men are those who hear the call of God and refuse to heed it. We sometimes get tired of worship and their songs and after we've sung it a few weeks and months. These worshiping creatures have sung the same song for millions and millions and millions of years and it is still as fresh and alive to them because they are consumed with gazing upon the beauty of God and declaring his glory continually and forever. His presence is a paradise. Don't settle for a heaven that doesn't have God at the very center of it. Give him your best praise today, friend. Give him the best of your heart today. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for this day and for this message. We pray it will touch someone's heart. We pray it will move us and shape us into being better and more thorough worshipers of the living God. We ask, Lord, that you would guide us in this holy endeavor. It's an endeavor of heaven. It's the enterprise of all of heaven. Father, make it the enterprise of your church today in these difficult days. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you and Lord willing, we'll see you next week.